Hello, welcome to my chat. I'm Paul Isaacs. I'm the director of Lenaro's data center and cloud group, and also a testing coordinator for OpenHPC and the co-chair of CentOS Cloud. So that, that's me. My talk, however, is about a journey towards a smart, scalable, high-performance computing for artificial intelligence. So welcome. The data center. I'm sure many of you have seen the inside of one, but can you remember more than 50 years ago? Personally, no. Uh, however, uh, the, here's an example of IBM's five megabyte drives, uh, significant sizes, and the reason uh, why we have data centers. It's when you've got equipment so big it doesn't fit in your office, you need a clean, safe environment um, to house this large equipment. Fortunately, we didn't stay at five megabytes for storage, otherwise we would need quite a lot of data centers. What we have evolved to, however, is petabytes of information being stored in data centers. Uh, a massive collation of information, although it's only information, when it's been processed. It comes in as raw data, and then we would hope that we have sufficient computation to number crunch that data to convert it into information. So as an example here, we've got a, a rack full of uh, Cray supercomputing blades, which would provide the massive amount of computation required. Um, apologies if you can hear the background of my fan for my laptop. I, I do have one of those supercomputing laptops. <laughs> Uh, as well. So it sort of goes par for the course. Uh, if you was inside the data center now, you're probably wanting to have headphones muffling out the sound. Um, well, we'll see how we go. Uh, hopefully the laptop doesn't get too loud. Uh, so with this petabytes of uh, information, uh, having been number crunched by these massive, uh, powerful blades of com computation, we should get answers to some questions. And those questions could come from uh, applications which we run, whether they're computational fluid dynamics, whether they're artificial intelligence, um, or, or whether it's just uh, accountancy. Um, it's a whole range of reasons why we have uh, that data in the data center. But the, the main reason would be you can't necessarily ship petabytes of information around the world just so that you can do a small amount of information processing on it and then ship the answer all the way back. What you want to do is send the request, have the request processed at where, uh, where the data is stored, and then you simply get the answer. That way you have the, the, this far less data transmission time and uh, latency and final answer is uh, reduced in time. And that's uh, ideally what we want to have. So the fastest response possible, covering the largest amount of data possible. But data centers continue to evolve. They don't just stop at uh, pure number crunching. And data centers are not going away. So whilst they are evolving to uh, provide more and more services, what we're actually seeing is consolidation of those data centers into hyperscalers. And so the hyperscalers would, uh, would hold key relevant data that they feel they can wrap a business around it. So uh, if we talk about uh, the Facebooks or the Amazons or the Googles, uh, they hold uh, data um, about people's uh, activities. And from there, the number crunch uh, those activities that uh, perhaps they want to do targeted ads um, or uh, sort of other things which are relevant to their particular users. And they can only do that when they've collated enough uh, data that a pattern can emerge. Now, not all data should fly into the hyperscalers. Uh, what you'll find is companies want to keep hold of their data, governments want to keep hold of their data, um, but, so whether it's national security or national prowess as to why they want to keep the data and not upload it to hyperscalers. Then there's, of course, uh, hyperscalers are providing a generic service um, with special features, but they may not have special hardware. 
So if we're if we're talking about conventional legacy servers, you could have uh, racks and racks of those servers available to hyperscalers and to conventional cloud providers. But what happens if you've got bespoke hardware? You would need to then still keep it in your own data center or as Lenaro has a co-location facility. And, and data centers won't go away because we, uh, as I put here, we've got cryptocurrency miners, which uh, are very power hungry um, users of this. Okay, so we're, we're saying that data centers are evolving, um, they're transitioning, but they're not going away. What we're seeing is different types of data, One, uh, some going to hyperscalers, some going to specialized data centers. So where is that data coming from? Well, there's many IoT sensors, so the Internet of Things, we're talking about potential billions of devices. But those devices are relatively small and they may only be providing um, sort of small amounts of data if, uh, say, there's a temperature change, then that could be just one piece of data from one particular uh, device. However, if you've got billions of devices, all dotted around the world, all providing weather sensitive information, then the culmination of that data is quite significant. It, it, it becomes a lot. Yeah. Then we have uh, mobile data. So again, large number of devices. Now, primarily they are used for streaming. Uh, the amount of people that actually use them for mobile phones, yeah. well, we, we will see. But uh, yes, streaming, but they are also a collation of sensor data. So as you move around um, using your GPS, uh, sort of reporting on your maps application, then that sensor data uh, could well be sent back to the cloud as an indication of where you are. I don't know if uh, some of your relatives have got the Find Me sort of app, so you can uh, identify where your uh, friends and relatives are at one time. Assuming, of course, they've granted you um, the, the right to, to view where they are. And then we have Edge. And the difference uh, with Edge, it varies. So are we talking about the edge of the data center or the edge of the network? And it could actually be both. Um, so Edge, we would see the operational management of remote devices. So whether it is your uh, the mobile antenna, the mast itself has its own uh, computational resource, and that is looking after all those mobile devices and IoT sensors that may be GPRS uh, aware. Um, and, uh, and so these are different elements of where we get this data. Um, stored into either our private data center or um, a, a more public uh, hyperscaler facility. And then with the uh, increasing computational capability on automotive, so all those sensors within the car, uh, whilst it's handy to have the data local um, for the time sensitive reasons, then you may also want to upload it to the cloud so that uh, you'll the next time that a vehicle needs servicing, then you will get a prompt. Um, if there needs to be a recall uh, for whatever reason, then uh, again, the cloud provider uh, will be able to have access to that data, um, upload to the manufacturer, and the manufacturer decide that, okay, those particular uh, cars need to, to do a recall. And of course, not only is the raw data itself from those sensors, but the data generated by processing any of the above. So uh, so we have, again, the, the opportunity to have petabytes of information. It just keeps growing. But how, how do we operate this? There's so many different components. What I'd like to just go over, you've heard it in a couple of other talks about heterogeneous systems. And for me, it's about heterogeneous agnosticism. That uh, basically means I don't mind what system uh, operates behind the scenes. All I want it to do is work. And so I, I need uh, the, the system to be available. I want a request to be answered promptly. 
I, I want to, to not have to wait in line. Uh, I, I just need it, the functions to be serviced. So whether, whether it's a, a particular architecture or not, matters not. And, and so if we look uh, uh, by example, so consumers by definition consume uh, information and they're interested in streaming apps, uh, chat, email, maps, and on occasion make a phone call. And they don't care whether it happens to need a virtual machine or a VM uh, running in the background with a terabyte of RAM, 128 cores, um, just to process it all. It's, they are agnostic. As long as, uh, as long as the response is done, fine, it works. Why do we need to know? Of course, businesses transact and governments provide citizen services and academia um, carry on research. So it's more than just um, an internet of consumption. It, it is a, a, a quite a varied uh, use of the internet. And data is flying all over, all over the place, but uh, you'll find that the data is being consumed in one direction and delivered to those data centers or hyperscalers from the various devices. How does that data get there? Well, ideally, we'd like it to be as uh, generic, uh, simplified, standardized as possible. And so we have a cloud native request response, whether it is getting the information, posting the information, putting it, patching it or deleting it. These are common uh, RESTful API uh, commands to transfer the data from the devices into the hyperscaler or um, cloud facilities. But as, as we said with uh, heterogeneous agnosticism, we don't care really whether what hardware it is, what firmware it is, what operating system. We just need to know that it has to be able to scale with the amount of people or systems that want to use it. Now at the back end, in the data center, we do care. And so there are, uh, we, we need to be able to uh, make sure that the systems are uh, specced sufficiently to provide the, um, the throughput and the low latency required or demanded by these consumers. So, Traditional legacy uh, server architecture would have one to four CPUs um, and provide the application within that single server chassis. But over time, we've managed to evolve the CPUs uh, to increase the number of cores. So we've jumped from sort of one to four CPUs with single processing options to now we're up to 128 cores per CPU. Um, now, what I've done is I created this table to uh, give you an idea as to where the data would be processed and the sort of scaling that is available uh, for the HPC cloud, uh, cloud solutions. This is not an absolute table. It, it can be open to interpretation, uh, which is fine because everybody is entitled to their own view as well. But this is an indicator. What I was looking at was uh, the traditional legacy CPU solutions probably aren't going to scale um, sufficiently for all that petabytes of information or data. So we, we look at how can we enhance it? Well, the, the first step that's been done in the data center is to go from CPU to adding an accelerator such as a GPU, so the graphics processing unit. But we know that typically it's not so much graphics processing, it's more mathematical calculations which can easily be parallelized. Um, that uh, is what a GPU helps with. And they typically have about three, three and a half thousand cores um, uh, available to them. But there is a, a data transfer overhead, as I've noted at the bottom. So shipping data between CPU to GPU and back again uh, incurs a transfer overhead. Uh, which can impact the overall latency uh, of the computation. So how do we uh, get around that? Well, we could 
transfer uh, things wholly into the GPU, if that were possible. Uh, but the GPU is not a general purpose uh, computational device. It's quite math specific. I've listed an MPU, sort of a neural network processing unit, and that potentially could have uh, 5,000 dedicated cores, or more than that. Um, but those cores uh, are, are even more specialized than the GPU. And then we have a DPU, the data processing unit, which otherwise known previously as SmartNIC. So a smart a SmartNIC provides the functionality um, or the processing capability closer to the network. So it doesn't have to go through a network card to the CPU and back through, uh, back again. It, it occurs network traffic onto the same card, processed and back off that card across the network again. So it has the potential to reduce latency significantly. So we could carry on interpreting all these different options on this table, but really what I'm, I'm sort of focusing down on is that as we get more and more specialized specific circuitry, so never mind just general purpose CPUs, but specialized circuitry, the latency can be massively reduced. And if the circuits are easily replicable, so, uh, then you could have racks and racks of specialized circuits uh, to answer specific queries. So if you know that you're uh, going to get from say 20 million uh, cars, which happens to be around about the amount in the, in the United Kingdom, uh, all sending back uh, velocity information, you don't necessarily need a general purpose CPU um, with low scalability uh, to, to handle 20 million inputs per second, if that was a requirement. What you may want to do is have a specialized circuit which simply accepts a pre-formatted RESTful API uh, call, accepts that data and stores it away. So, uh, so we can get highly specialized circuits, very low latency with massive amount of scale. Now, what, we'd, what we would ideally like is a bit of uh, flexibility. We don't want to keep replacing circuit boards in solutions just, to, uh, just when a new requirement comes into being. So FPGA, so the programmable gateways, give us the opportunity to change the logic on the fly um, and, and provides a reasonable amount of scalability. And if you marry the, D, the FPGA with the DPU, so we are then providing the, the processing flexibility of a dedicated circuit right next to the network, then that hints at being a um, highly scalable solution. And that is actually the, the way we see uh, the high performance computing going. And so more specialized cards to, uh, to perform more specialized functions. So here I've got an example of a DPU with the GPU. So this uh, this particular card, it's a uh, NVIDIA or Mellanox uh, Bluefield 2 card. It has a, a relatively low core count for general purpose computing. Um, that's uh, the smaller chip to the left. And then a large GPU. So there's still the potential for a latency overhead between the two um, or you can have the low core count CPU simply managing uh, the card itself and data flying through the GPU to the network and back. So th this is an accelerated option um, that is geared towards artificial intelligence. Now, we see things evolve. And the involvement we've seen recently is over the last few years, uh, we, we saw uh, high, perform high performance computing uh, using the Thunder X2 platform. Now this was a, a CPU that was in the chassis. And that chassis, chassis CPU has now migrated to become a DPU. So it's interesting to see the, how, how we see the technology moving from chassis to uh, effectively an intelligent network card. 
but still we see evolving things happen. Uh, we, we can see this as the layout of an Apple M1 chip. Now this is a relatively low core count solution at the moment. But to note the differences, this is a system on chip. It's got not just the, uh, the generic or uh, CPU, so the general purpose for processing, it's also got dedicated on there a GPU and a neural engine, all on the same wafer. So if we're looking for scalability of reduced latency, having the systems within uh, the same wafer for processing, processing uh, definitely gives a speed advantage. But we don't stop there, we like to evolve. So instead of just looking at uh, the, the surface area of the wafer, how about stacking on top? So here's an example from a couple of years ago of uh, a ARM research Neovers chiplet. So with stacked wafers on top of each other to provide multiple uh, processing units within the same uh, encapsulated uh, chip. So we've got the potential of uh, large core counts, specialized circuitry, and all within a very uh, small area. And that actually makes for uh, being easily mounted on DPUs or network cards or uh, accelerator cards, if, if we'd like to call them that way. So that's the way we think we're going, uh, is stacked chips. I mentioned FPGA. F FPGA, uh, we can already uh, handle within a data center. But rather than taking too much time, because I, I know time's coming up, but um, effectively we're able to control uh, the delivery of logic to the FPGA uh, so that data can be accelerated very, very easily. But the service chassis itself stops being a legacy server and it becomes more of simply a host for all these smart cards. So Lenaro's data center and cloud group, what we're doing is we're looking at how to auto scale these devices, so these DPUs and server chassis um, to, be, uh, to be available for high scalability. And we're looking at the challenges of how to get the data in and out as fast as possible and uh, the infrastructure required to support this. So whether it's storage um, or it's computational backend or the orchestration. So this is all about the relevance of what we're working towards. But is the, open, is the operating system still relevant if we're talking about FPGA logic? Well, it is for now, uh, definitely, because you don't want every application to have to understand how to talk to bare metal solutions. But if we uh, have the cloud native logic embedded within an FPGA or DPU, then it is a questionable area to look at. OpenStack, we uh, will do uh, upstreaming work in this area and uh, OpenStack we use for node orchestration. So whether to bring a particular chassis up or down. And open HPC. So this is the computational element. So we're looking at how jobs can be parallelized across nodes and uh, how, how many nodes are required to actually make the computation work effectively. So they are still relevant um, for these specialist cards we need to make sure we evolve uh, with the solutions that are required too. So just quickly, uh, touching on to uh, the rest of um, the talk. So artificial intelligence, because that's what we're, uh, the talk is aimed at, is about, we provide the, the high performance computing backend, the infrastructure, and then we'll be able to overlay an intelligent solution to, to be able to say, what is required in terms of scalability. So do we bring a particular chassis online to, for servicing an additional number of uh, input requests? Or um, do we shut them down because there is a, a quiet point? So 
this is where we're, we're investigating applying AI as a solution. So just to, to wrap up, I will just quick go into uh, the last areas. So I said heterogeneous agnosticism, but Lenaro is all about the ARM uh, ecosystem. So what we're looking at is making sure that we optimize for the ARM components. We already know ARM is dominant in IoT sensors and SBCs, but we're all, it's also holding the number one spot with uh, Fujitsu's um, and Wiccan's Fugaku supercomputer. So hyperscalers are noticing the performance improvements in the ARM environment. Our LDCG skill sets are evolving. When moving from server uh, legacy into artificial intelligence um, supplying uh, performance or, or AI to provide performance related improvements. And we're looking uh, to use the Neoverse platform uh, as a way to do this. Now, what I would do is tell you what the latest is. We've, we recently got the FX700 computer and uh, this is the performance related device uh, that we're looking to operate both OpenStack, OpenHPC and AI specific um, frameworks of so the machine learning frameworks of TensorFlow and PyTorch. These are now running on an A64FX solution. So all in all, what I'd like to say is the HPC Smart Scale project with artificial intelligence is about scaling the infrastructure behind the scenes using artificial intelligence so that the cloud native solution, uh, requests that come into a network are able to be supported and supplied, uh, responded to within the shortest amount of time. So with that, I say thank you very much.